psychology store. Um, we sell our pre board plates. Um, no one can hear you on this. Um, Alright. On mine. Can you? I got an idea. Alright, I'll be right back. Um, can anyone hear me? I just put on a headset for some audio. Give us a thumbs up or a like if you can hear me now. Alright, I'll just uh, proceed. Alright guys a sound check here. Give us some likes if you can hear the audio. Just so everyone knows I'm going live on YouTube and TikTok. So I'll be answering um, questions live. And I got my wife here. She's doing all the media so she can help help answer some questions. All right, sounds like audio is good. So we're going to be doing some liquid cultures. I just moved a bunch of plates that I poured earlier this week off to the side. And it's really important to let your plates sit there for a couple days so you can catch any bacteria or yeast or molds that might have fallen onto the plates when you were um, pouring them. So I'm just going to put on some new gloves. So, I've also got some slants back here. I'll just leave those. Um, how I lay out my flow hood is that the back area here will be the most clean because the air is pushing from the, the top down and out. So this area, especially up high, is the cleanest portion of the flow hood. And this area here is kind of my workspace. So I've got a bunch of different liquid culture strains that I just got finished QCing. So I quality control all my strains to make sure that there's no bacteria or yeast or mold that's inside the liquid culture. So one of the good indicators is um, the turbidity of the solution. So you can see, especially some of these settled cultures, 
you can see right through the liquid culture even this really large lion's mane here you can see pretty clearly um, one, a good test is to just be able to read the text and you can clearly read what that's saying through the liquid culture so that's a good indication that there's no bacteria or yeast and then before I make all my liquid cultures I like to spin them on the plate stir and that way the solution becomes homogeneous um, I've got a bunch of syringes here just a sterile lure lock disposable syringe you can actually reuse these I've uh, autoclaved them before in a pinch but the rubber will get a little bit deformed over time and then I've got a box of um, these are 18 gauge needles so I prefer the 18 gauge if we're going into um, the silicon seal injection port the larger gauge needles work well but um, it extends the life a little bit if you use a smaller gauge needle All right, so all the different cultures. Um, this is a blue oyster from three days ago, so I'll probably let that one continue to grow a little bit. This is a chestnut from 11.6, so about 10 days growth, and you can see nice, healthy mycelium. Um, we've got some wild chanterelles here. Really strong growth on that. So there's a couple papers for released from September. Um, this is some uh, our rosebud pink oyster. Nice, healthy. Shiitake. We've got our West Coast shiitake. Boletus edulis, so porcini. This one probably has a little bit longer to go. And enoki, also a little bit longer to go. You can see there's start some colonies starting to form, but I'll let those go a little longer. And then our lion's mane. So we got lots of healthy lion's mane in there that we're going to be spinning down. So there was a couple of scientific papers from France that were released in September, and it describes a evergreen bush and a Pseudomonas bacteria being cultivated with Boletus edulis, and they were successfully able to fruit, um, or at least colonize the roots of the bush so I think that it is possible to mimic nature in science and I think it would be really cool if some Boletus edulis or Porcini alright so the first step Um, we're going to need to spray these tops with some alcohol. And as that evaporates, 
we'll start to pull some liquid cultures from these jars. So I like to use these jars before going into the media extractor just so I get a clean liquid culture every time. So it's kind of like a mini sample for quality control. So this is a bear's head culture. First time I've ever had a bear's head. Um, Heresium americanum. And it's similar to lion's mane. But it grows a little bit more tendrils. And it has almost like a calamari texture compared to the flaky texture of a lion's mane. And pulling out some mycelium and I've got some sterile lure locks here so we got our first heresium americanum culture and these will be going up on Etsy And since I'm working in a flow hood, I could leave that needle inside that gasket there. And I always like to just prime it so I can get a really nice mixture. But it looks like some really healthy heresium. Usually heresium will look pretty granular in solution, so it likes to form tiny little clusters and that's how you separate it out from any mold. A mold will usually grow into like a balloon shape um, if, it's, if it's left if it's left undisturbed in solution molds will usually grow like spherical or they'll grow into like a really cool looking balloon and then mycelium typically will grow into different globs, but lion's mane is an exception. At least the ones that I work with will tend to grow little star shape. Colonies. All right, does anyone have some questions out there? What about morels? So we've got some morel patches growing in the backyard. Um, morels are arguably a saprobe, which means that they feed on dead wood, but I believe that they're mycorrhizal in their nature as well, which means that they grow at the roots of plants. Um, it's really difficult to cultivate morel mushrooms, but there's a couple places in the world that are doing it commercially. There's a farm in Iowa and a few places in China, and reportedly there's a farm in, in France as well. And that same farm in France is attempting to grow Boletus edulis and possibly, you know, other mycory mycorrhizal species. Yep, so there's a, a video on YouTube that the guy from Iowa, he basically shows off a giant hoop house that he has, I don't know, probably 50 to 100 pounds of morels fruiting. So we'll see if he can, you know, continue that production, and that's really cool. All 
All right, so I'm just still working on bear's head, or also known as Heresium Americanum. So brand new culture, got it in a trade. If anyone's ever open for uh, trading, just shoot me an email, freshfromthefarmfungi at gmail.com. And, you know, I'm usually open to trade liquid cultures for liquid cultures, or I prefer petri dish cultures. And we're going to be stocking some of these cultures at Lion's Mane in the near future. So you'll be able to pick pick them up locally and avoid the mail system. We've been having a couple issues, not too many, but up until a couple months ago, I'd never had any issues in the mail. And I feel like they're just uh, working overtime these days. But check out our Etsy, Fresh Fungi. We've got a bunch of liquid cultures, some plates, some slants, and um, heresium. We've got lion's mane mushroom capsules. Um, $35 free shipping on Etsy. All right, so we're looking for a CSA. There's a, a couple local ones, but they already have other mushroom producers, so we haven't found a CSA. We were working with four seasons in Wheat Ridge, and they just, unfor unfortunately, their business just shut down for good. Um, so we haven't been doing deliveries for about two months now. They retired, yeah. My wife wants to make, make sure everyone knows they just retired and they moved back to the farm so they could focus on their animals. And So a basic setup, you just need a pressure cooker. I would say um, some form of sterilization and then uh, a vessel that you can safely pressure cook like a jar or a mushroom bag and then just a clean culture number one um, as long as you have healthy genetics that's all you really need and then the substrate that goes inside the bag that the mushrooms grow on. So they um, grow on sawdust or some species grow on compost. So you can buy grow kits. Uh, we don't sell any grow kits, but there's a really good company called North Spore. Uh, they're from Maine and their logo is like a compass rose. They sell really good grow kits. So I would suggest just starting with a grow kit and then, you know, you can watch the mushroom fruit that way and you'll get a really good understanding of um, the life cycle of the mushroom. All right, guys, so we're just... Uh, doing some live streaming of um, I'm pulling some liquid cultures of mycelium which is the roots of the mushroom so inside this jar is a honey solution and I'm just drawing up you can see the tiny little fragments that are going into the syringe that is um, the mycelium, which is the roots of the mushroom. So this is the starting process, or it's essentially the seeds 
that you would use to start growing mushrooms. And basically, I'm cloning them. So we've got some new varieties that we're breeding. And I'm just going to do some test runs with these. And we also sell all of our genetics on Etsy. So if you check out our Etsy store, Fresh Fungi, we've got all of our different cultures and stir plate here so it's a little bit out of screen but right this is a pink oyster mushroom and then right here we've got a shiitake west coast shiitake so i'm gonna put that on the stir plate and spin it up and then i'll set all of these off to the side so we don't get them mixed up And I like to use these uh, bags that the slants come in because they're sterile. So I could just keep them in these sterile bags. How much growth are you looking for before you start pulling the LC? So basically I wait about a week. Um, it will start to plateau in these little jars. So these small jars I use for my mini QC to ensure that this is clean. So I'll grow this out, QC it, and then if that passes, I'll pull these out and leave these as a clean stock. So I can use my media extractor bottles, which is a two liter, and then I'll, I'll increase this a lot and get really thick growth in the larger bottle. But basically, I'm just turning over my inventory with these small jars and I'm quality controlling them at the same time. So that's how you keep a lot of different varieties in one small area. Like right here is, you know, two, four, six, eight, eight different types of mushrooms. But you can see the growth right here. It's pretty thick that's like a really good quality or quantity and then this one right here which is a few days old not much growth you can see a little bit there so I'll let this go for about a week but that uh, Heresium Americanum took about 14 days to get to that point so it just depends on the strain All right, so we are going into our rosebud auger, right? Or uh, rosebud pink oyster. And this is probably the favorite strain from our breed project in the springtime. So if you haven't checked out our YouTube channel for all the TikTok people, we have a playlist that's called Breeding Mushrooms from Spores. And we bred a few different varieties of mushrooms from a spore and we ended up getting some really cool varieties and this is one of them it's called rosebud and it's a pink oyster so it's a pink mushroom that looks like a cluster of roses and it tastes like almost like salmon like seafood flavor but with lots of umami But, so these cultures will be going up on Etsy later. And if anyone has any suggestions of, you know, a different variety of mushroom that we don't offer, um, let us know. I would like to start growing some portobellos and some agaricus mushrooms but it's a whole different process and we're starting some cordyceps mushrooms as well we have um, a couple jars of our cordyceps in the fridge that 
I'm just waiting on the QC, but it looks pretty good. So we will be having some cordyceps available soon too. Our C3, C10, and C3, C12, I believe, those were the best phenotypes. Alright, anyone got got any other questions? I think it's a pretty good first ever Fungi Friday. I'm planning on doing some more of these in the future and doing some different techniques. We're going to be doing some classes with MushroomCult.net in Denver and Castle Rock starting in January. And check out microdose uh, mycology festival this weekend we're going to be doing a panel discussion on sunday at 10 a.m with some really cool mycologists um, alex door is going to be moderating he's the owner of um, one of the biggest cordyceps farms in north america so he'll be there to answer questions about cordyceps mushroom revival i think is their company but he has a really cool story about self-curing himself um, from lyme disease using cordyceps mushroom so that'll be super super cool Yeah, so we'll be posting some more information on our class schedule. We're hoping to have one, at least one online class per month to um, allow some people. So I captured some of those cordyceps beetles um, and I'm still not sure if the cordyceps killed them or if they just kind of colonized them and the beetles died. I found a bunch of deceased beetles underneath the plant and then I found about a dozen Japanese beetles that were infected with the organism and then I have those in the jar and you know they died but I have yet to find any fruiting bodies, so it's still kind of uncertain. I have the, the culture on auger, but I haven't grown it out and I haven't had it tested. Like I think DNA testing would probably be the best way to figure it out, but it, you know, definitely colonized the beetle and there was dead beetles and like I have a, a few specimens that have that's mummified it just never fruited yep so cordyceps is an entomopathogenic fungi that infects its host which it can be a beetle, it can be a larva. It's most often um, infects moth larva, but it can even infect a wasp. I think, you know, there's a couple dozen species of insects that this mushroom will latch onto and then it colonizes them and it can even, you know, morph their behavior to cause them to climb up to a taller branch and then they'll fruit and release their spores so it's a it's almost like a zombie mushroom that it will take over its host or if you, if you ever saw the spongebob episode where plankton took over mushrooms Alright guys, we're going to be finishing up these pink oysters. We've got a bunch more of these to go through. 
but I'm probably gonna tap out in a second. But I'll go grab that jar of the beetles and I'll leave it up to you guys to, you know, to think, are, were these cordyceps or not? Um, I'll probably grow those out soon. I just haven't had time. But probably one more. It's the final draw for these pink oyster rosebud. Now I gotta find the cap. Here it is. So this is why you should be a lot more organized than me. Alright, I'll go grab the jar. Just wait here. I'm back. Back with um, my cordyceps samples. So you can see here I've got some cordyceps that are pinning. So that is a C3, C10. And I'm going to be doing some of these tonight, too, or tomorrow morning. Um, so we'll have a two-pack for 30 of our two best phenotypes. And then these are the beetles. It's really hard to see. Um, I wish I could see... A little bit more clearly but not, not sure if you can see the fuzz Hold on I'll put them on a petri dish really tough to see that middle one there has a lot of uh, fuzz around it yeah so that's mycelium that's the mycelium from the cordyceps Yep, so this is our cordyceps mycelium infecting some Japanese beetles. So it's an entomopathogenic fungi right here. And it will infect the beetle. You can see that fuzz right there. That's the mycelium. And it's a natural pesticide that's pretty selective. So you can spray spray this and then they'll dig themselves in the grass and potentially you can get some mushrooms. Um, it's still super, super early in the works, but I'll have to be growing out these over the winter. Alright guys, thanks for tuning in to Fungi Friday. What's up guys? We're going to be uh, finishing these cultures up. Till next time, much love.
save it. Mm-hmm.